guys, welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Van Chats. I'm here with Mandy Marquardt. Thank you so much for coming. You're the bomb.com and a half. And yeah, so I've traveled with Mandy a few times and um, she's a sprinter. And honestly, I met Mandy when I started racing and she was like one of the first, I would say, yeah, like one of the first pro cyclists in the track scene that actually like lended a helping hand. Um, and it, it's really cool to then eventually be traveling with her, riding with her, and now having her on my podcast. So, Mandy, how are you? Yo, 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 John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm good. And yeah. it's just, it's awesome to talk to you. I've done, you know, some podcasts, but it just feels pretty cool to do one with you. And, you know, you've been kicking butt at these. So, yeah. thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, it's like, it's honestly like having a phone conversation with a friend and then ha letting the world listen in on that phone conversation, which I don't know if it's a good thing <laughs> or a bad thing, but it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting doing these podcasts. But I'm ask you some questions. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So, well, Chloe started doing that in the middle of our podcast. So, um, but yeah, so let's, let's dive into a little bit about who you are. So like if anybody's listening that doesn't know you, let's, let's kind of dive into the background of you as a cyclist. Cause I think you kind of have a cool, interesting story. Yeah, for sure. So I was born in Germany. My dad's German. Um, my mom's from Florida. And when I was about six, we moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where my mom's from. And my parents started getting me into swimming um running tennis i was just doing it all just to stay active and um yeah it was, it was just a great experience to just be involved in all that and really want to try a triathlon because like why not mm -hmm. <laughs> and florida's pretty popular with those so i just really found my passion for cycling because i found the velodrome down there the brian pickle velodrome have you been yeah. down there? i haven't i haven't been down there uh it's a track that like i've it's just far enough that it would be a pain in the ass to get to, but it's just close <laughs> enough that I should have gone when I was on yeah. these days. Well, you can always go. It's still there. Yeah. Um, I don't know right now with COVID times because um, it's in the parks and rec, but it's a pretty cool velodrome. Pretty similar to T-Town here, but a little steeper. Anyway, so it's a great facility. I wish it was definitely more popular, um, but yeah, I found my love there. Carlos Laborde, he was uh, a coach there, and that's how I met Mike Crazy up here one of uh, former coaches too for USAC. And I think he was the president of USA Cycling a um, long time ago. But anyway, just I've met so many incredible people in the sport down there and uh, so many opportunities arise. And yeah, it was like a year later, I did my first, uh, was it my first road nationals, 10, 12. I was with Kendall Ryan and her sister, Alexis. And uh, Shelby Reynolds, like all of us. Racing. Man, that's that's some legit sprinters up in there. Yeah, way back. So yeah, yeah it was my first road and track national. So on the road, it was pretty cool to to finish uh, there with two gold medals and a silver at my first. So I was like, what am I doing? I'm like, okay, this yeah. is cool. I get to travel and see all these cool places. So yeah. I just fell in love with it. No, that's that's super cool. And so you ride for Team Nova Nordis, right? And yeah you have been riding for them for like, I mean, pretty much ever, right? Like, Decade. I mean, yeah. 10 yeah. years already. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. That's insane. And so when did you, like, when did you find out about like diabetes and like how you had it and like how you handle that? Cause like, I mean, even just traveling with you was like, I was thinking to myself, if I had to add another thing into my travel routine, I would probably go nuts. But like you have this like routine dialed down before dinner and it's this whole thing with training and recovery. So tell us a little bit about how that's kind of affected you as an athlete and how you've kind of gone through it. Yeah. Um, so when I was 14, my parents had split. And so, you know, it's kind of a dream to go over to Europe and race. Uh, mm -hmm. Got that opportunity um, because my dad, I lived, you know, moved back over there and I have dual citizenship. So I was like, all right, I want to go over there and race. I went to an American high school over there in an army base. Pretty kind of cool setup. Um, yeah. Lived off campus. Of course, my dad's not in the military, but um, kind of lived on my own for a bit at, at around 15, 16 years old and uh, brought myself to school, brought myself to training. I didn't live with my father then yet. He kind of wow. set up somewhere at a, like a, a boarding house. Wow. Um, so it was kind of cool to already like, do be an adult at such a young age and yeah. you know, I could have like taken advantage of that and like partied and done all this you know stuff yeah. no I was pretty focused already and um 
I just really just wanted to do well and have this really close relationship with my father. I mean, he's always been such a big person in my life in sports. So just when he left and my parents split, that was just so hard for me. But just seeing this opportunity arise and he being there for me was just a really big transition. Um, and yeah, I was racing for a bit for the state of baden Württemberg because um, Germany is in different states and made the state team. We went to nationals as a state team and things went really well. Then I went to VO2 max testing in later in the year, about November it was, and uh, my diabetes anniversary is coming up. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I was uh, doing some VO2 max testing. They did blood work and then they found out that my blood sugars were really elevated. They waited a while until it came down, but nothing, it didn't really come down. So my dad picked me up because um, I went with a, a teammate up for testing. So yeah, I was in the hospital then for two weeks. They were just doing all this testing to make sure all my organs were still functioning. Um, you know, my, my pancreas is not functioning at all, which is supposed to give me insulin, which is then everything that I eat is supposed to be converted into energy. So basically on my own pancreas now for life, which is fine. I mean, I wish it would work, but, um, yeah. but yeah, it was just so hard to grasp already at like 16 years old, like this transition and then being in Germany, like being especially so like, did you feel weird or anything? Cause like you hear these like diabetic stories where it's like people go into like a shock or like they have a bad they have yeah. like an issue but you're telling me that you just did a vo2 max test and you're like oh okay cool they take your blood and they're like uh mandy yeah let's we gotta talk there's something not right here and then you're in the yeah. hospital that's kind of gonna be scary at that age <laughs> pretty much i was like what did i do did i cause this diabetes yeah. like did i do something wrong like i've been an athlete my entire <laughs> life like what did i yeah. do yeah, no, they're just like, it can just happen at any age. Puberty, just, you know, there's some of my teammates, um, they're diagnosed when they're really young, and some are even diagnosed when they're older. So it, there's yeah. really no specific age, but I just noticed, like, I just took forever to warm up. Like, I just didn't feel like I had energy. Like, I was just really sluggish, you know, just like, you just feel tired and groggy, and you're just like trying to get out of all, your a hole. Like, you're like, all right, let's go. So it kind of, Took a lot of that because my blood sugar was just always high so i just felt really sluggish um but then yeah i learned how to manage my diabetes which is always still like a lot of trial and error you know you add a lot of other variables in there like travel and time zone changes but you know we'll get there but yeah, yeah i just learned there and that i met with so many doctors and there's one that was overseeing all the doctors and he told me you know mandy we know this is gonna be really difficult um but you know i really don't think you'll be able to compete at a high level in your sport you know with the, with diabetes and i really truly did believe him I'm like okay i'm probably gonna hurt myself like i'm yeah. maybe gonna do something wrong and so i talked to my dad and i didn't know any other athletes with type one at the time um none actually and i just noticed too um there wasn't a lot of support or awareness around type one diabetes and athletes and my dad was just really positive and it brought us closer because i become you know more educated he found me one of the best doctors in Mannheim where i was born and we were living so I was just like, all right, well, all right, I'll just go get back on the bike and just like see how it goes. Yeah. And um, it was a little bit before I was diagnosed. I actually did German nationals. I was an endurance rider, did the 500 and took bronze in the junior event. And then a year later after I was diagnosed, I went and did nationals again. I was like, okay, I just want to try nationals before I go back to the States. Cause I was like, I want to go back to America, finish my last year, senior year in school and go to college. So I did German nationals 500 again, and I was bronze in the same event. So for me, that was kind of like one of those pivotal moments. Cause I was like, wow, I did this with, without diabetes and I'm doing this with diabetes. It's definitely possible, but it's a lot harder. Um, yeah. So it just kind of, I started to learn more about my body and, you know, went back to America and um, went to Penn State Lehigh Valley, found team Nova Nordisk in 2010. I've been on the team for so long, did a lot of crits, was so terrible with crits because like my blood sugar just rise because I was this huge adrenaline rush and my blood sugar yeah. would be so high and I just the track was always more a little bit man manageable for me mm -hmm. um yeah I was just learning so much about how to manage my diabetes and now we're in all type one yeah like, yeah, yeah which is which is insane to think about because like I remember <clears throat> I remember traveling with you in the sense of like because it and this is like just last year. And so like, this is something that you've been thinking about for like, you know, 10 years. Right. Um, but it's almost as if 
like it still changes for you. Like you're still learning, you're still figuring it out, which is like got to be so difficult. And so the fact that you're like still pushing through that is like super impressive because it was, yeah, it's one of those things that I've always kind of been envious of, like is the fact that like for me, I felt that <clears throat> I tried all these diets, you know, when I was like trying to lose weight or whatever, like my food and my recovery. And I figured out that like eating is, you know, 50% of the staple. Yeah. And then like the training is the other, you know, it's like, it's got a, it's got a heavy weight, but then the sleep and the things like that, but the food almost affects the sleep and the, you know, and the racing and everything. So it's the fact that that plays in and then you're at such a high level is so impressive. Um, it's like, I kind of analogy of like a power meter, like try to hold, I don't know, 150 watts, not the average, but just yeah. try to, it's, it's impossible like there's yeah. so many variables on the street you know you have hills like yeah it's like living with diabetes like you just kind of have to go with it but as long as like most of the time I'm very on it and managing it then I'm good <laughs> yeah and that's the thing like I can stop and take a break and gain like you know you know what I mean like I can I can break my diet and be like okay phew, I can just come yeah. back tomorrow whereas like for you it really if affects you <laughs> like it affects yeah. everything like it's not just something you can just step back and do and not so really. yeah it's like if i'm gonna have a pizza on an off day oh man all right so i have to give myself more insulin because i didn't exercise that day there's yeah. like so many other things like i'm always doing math in my head not oh my gosh. about it and then yeah. like about the time zone changes like i do have to work with my um diabetes educator for my team and she's like there's so much research that she's done too with my team because you know the men's pro team is traveling all over the world but here I am as a sprinter too. And I'm like, it's just, it's same, but different. Um, you know, so just time zone changes were then my long acting insulin. Cause I take a long acting and a fast acting insulin. And those change too, depending on if I don't do exercise that day and I'm just traveling and then switching time zones. So there's just so many things that I always have to be mindful about, but so does any other athlete, like yeah, what they eat, what they pack. I mean, how you know what they'll do when they get to the race i mean there's just so many things well i think it's already tedious for us like it's even more tedious for you it's like kind of what i was trying to get at you know it's like yeah every athlete does have to look at it but like i don't have to measure anything really in the sense like i can eyeball it be like yeah that's close enough or that's good enough or like (laughs) uh, wait (laughs) yeah or like hey i forgot a bar and it's like oh crap i can just pick any i can just pick up anything and eat it where you know it's uh, like it just kind of makes I could see it making for a little bit more hectic. And then, um, but yeah, so that being said, like with, with the choice of being a sprinter or being an endurance rider, like I would think, and I'm just doing this based off like my basic knowledge, like because you're going into glycolysis so much quicker, like, is it, would it, in theory, would it be technically harder to be a sprinter or is it like because of the endurance events, because they're so long and you're just having to eat, 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 eat during those big endurance events. Um, and carbohydrates and managing that um like wouldn't it or is it just like depends on what you're doing like they're all about the same like i i guess more or less my question is is like did you pick sprinting because it would be easier to manage diabetically or were you like oh no it's just that's what i wanted to do like i wanted to be a sprinter um so really great question um just because like you know because you're a cyclist and you get it but Yeah, I really, I enjoyed endurance and training endurance. I did, but Mm -hmm. I just never felt like I got really good at it. Like I wasn't good at the police races. I was good at scratch races and shorter events. And um, yeah, I I did like the 2K when I was younger. It was, you know, that was a great event. It was kind of like, all right, I know what I need to do and I'm going to do it. But yeah, you throw in more variables, like different changes in in speed in a longer event. It's, It's a little bit harder, but um, here we, you know, Matt Bernowski and his parents and David Espinoza, like they're all sprinters and they were like, Mandy, why don't you sprint? Like you would be really good. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't understand sprint. Like, I don't, I didn't really actually get it. Yeah. I thought, oh, you just do 200 meters and you travel everywhere. And I, I just didn't, there was not a lot of education behind it. So I met Andrew Harris here of Edge Cycling and he put, you know, got me on board in 2013. Um, I remember doing collegiate nationals. Um, yeah. And I was like, okay, this is actually fun. And I felt like my body was really just, really just adapting to that more, not just like my diabetes management. Yeah. It was cool to be able to do a short event, come back in check my blood sugar and really just manage it more. But 
I just really liked the training aspect of sprinting. I thought it was really fun. I love the gym. I love, you know, how there's so many different varieties in training too, but yet it's so explosive and yet so different. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I found it hard actually to manage my diabetes too. I mean, both ways, both directions, because there's nerves that in, go go with it that spike my blood sugar. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just everything from what I eat to also, you know, burning more calories by, you know, even being in the gym more, you know, so it's everything, I wouldn't say one's easier. I just found one that worked for my body and for, I think my, where I was getting my best results and I think, yeah, it's, it's been a great career so far. Um, definitely. Yeah. I think I made the right decision. Um, and I enjoy training. Like I do enjoy the process. So. Yeah. And so, and that's, and yeah, cause like, as you were talking through that, it kind of made me think like, well, okay. With the sprinting, you're, you're, you're spike, spiking the blood sugar pretty quick with the endurance it's just hard to manage because you're not checking it. So I can see them both being kind of equal. It's just a matter of like, which one you want to go for, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, my so, teammates are racing all over the world and racing stage races. I mean, years of doctors on our team, like doing research and, and really how, you know, they really stepped it up and have gotten some phenomenal results. And a lot of, you know, you hear a lot of things like, Oh, they're just like a charity team. Oh, they're just like a, you're just on the team because you have diabetes, but no, you actually like, you do have to be, you know, getting results and pretty good and be managing your diabetes. They have a Devo team and like a talent ID camp, like they do this. So they help these younger athletes start to manage and, and do these things, um, you know, to get them ready for the pro level too. It isn't, you know, it's, it's a big part of like what you're putting into it as well. That's what they're, you know, giving them those resources. And I think that's, what's really cool about the team too, is that, it's kind of like this really nice pipeline. Like you, you know, you get to, you get to certain steps and you, okay, you work here and you work there. Um, and they've just, I've been on the team for 10 years and they've just continued to support my dreams too on the track. Yeah. So even if somebody said that it is a charity case in the sense that, Oh, it's just cause you have diabetes, they're just going to give you a handout. Well, you did break the national record in the kilometer. So I, I don't understand how much of a handout that was because I mean that, that time, in 2017 we would have stood on the podium together well did you have you thought of that no I, not really i was yeah. just thinking like because the yeah i didn't really think of that in 2017 <laughs> if you would have raced the men's kilo you would have gotten <laughs> third so you would have gotten yeah you would have been right behind your fiance that's pretty cool yeah and so that's and that's when i, I saw even... that yeah when i saw that i was like oh that's insane like and let's top this all off <laughs> it was in drop bars on a 333 uh, it was and so, so too. <laughs> and so like with wind and and and, and i again like for a second i'm not gonna lie to you i thought the timing strip was wrong but it was like there's no way they're posting that out and now my mom took a video too and i double checked it they were it was all spot on yeah because like i mean that's two seconds off of what you did the previous year. Well, I was racing the whole day too. Yeah, right? yeah, and then mind you, you've been racing the whole day. And it's funny, cause like, I remember watching you rock up to it and it was almost like you were being forced to do it. Like, uh, kind of. Okay, cause it looked like you were just like, I don't care, like, I'm not here. And then you just went out and smashed it. And they then, didn't so, tell me what gear I was on. They wouldn't tell uh, me what gear. They were just like, we threw on a gear and you, yeah, you're, you're gonna do it. I was like, okay. And I remember starting me like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, and so it's insane to see that. Um, and so that being said, like, what, like, what's your kind of thought process in the sense of like training for an effort like that, like as a sprinter, cause females aren't doing kilometers anyway. And so like for a 500, like, are you training kilometer or like, what's your ambitions behind that? Or was it just to, just to essentially set the record? Um, I, there's a couple of things behind that. So I wanted to see if I could better my own time from the previous mm -hmm. year. I also, you know, really in the mindset going into it this year too, and just with everything that happened with Kelly Caitlin, um, she, she had the record um, and she set that in Aguas um, in, in 2016. But yeah, and part of me, I did it for her too. Um, yeah. And it's just, there's some, this drive of like, 
I just want to go out and see what I can do. Yeah, with like, no racing. Yeah. Well, yeah, with no racing, and I have, didn't train specifically for the kilo. I was doing all of my training, specific training. I mean, we've been in a heavy training block for a while now, even leading up to that. I mean, I wasn't even peaked for that. I wasn't yeah. even. I was training right through it. Um, so, yeah, it was just cool to see, like, mentally, physically, what I was able to do. Um, it was just a cool challenge, and also yeah. my teammates, like they, that you know, my cycling teammates, they actually did the same time. But before that, they were giving me a hard time, like, "Oh, you're, you're in the, you're in drop bars. They like should be in in the air bars." I'm like, "No, no, it's okay. I got it." Like yeah. my mentality is, I've been just training and in, in uh, drop bars, like doing our 500s and, and everything else in them. So I'm like, "Why am I gonna change my position for?" No, for sure relapse <laughs> yeah yeah like if you if it's not something that you haven't like had a feel for yet it's probably not a good idea to just but i actually it, as much as i it hurt like i kind of like the event <laughs> it's a fun event it, especially and i don't know if it's like i might be biased but like i just think it's you're a national a, champion yeah it's a fun event like i i think it's a great event it's a painful event but it's it's really cool to see how it unfolds because i think there's so much to be won and there's so much to be lost so quick. Like you can be winning it in the first lap mm -hmm. and then lose it in the last lap. And it's, it, to me, that's like, that's what makes it great. Like, I mean, and now having to do it twice in a single day, I think yeah, also I <laughs> makes it a lot of fun. Uh, I'll um, think about that one. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that's also the exciting part to that is, is, is having to, like you could qualify first and finish eighth in the matter of a day yeah and it's 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 kind of impressive and it's kind of interesting to kind of play out and uh and do and so and could so yes yeah, say again could i do it at nationals would i be no able? i don't think you can mm. yeah okay. and that's some bullshit i'm just gonna go ahead and say that out loud right now usa cycling i think it's bullshit because uh jennifer valente was gonna race our madison Oh, sweet. They, and they would not let her race the Madison. Uh, I think it was in 2017 because it was a men's Madison, men's Madison national championship. If it was not a national championship, she could, she could have raced. Uh, but I think it's because of the UCI points maybe that oh. it, it would like negate the UCI points, which to me, it's like, why? I mean, if anything, she probably could have gotten second yeah uh, for sure. so like i mean it would have been interesting to watch and so that's why i said that made the comment about the kilo because i'm like thinking to myself like oh man like if they had a women's kilo national championship i wonder if like because you know how like sometimes people compare times right um i wonder if that would have ended up because i feel like between, I feel like Chloe could qualify. I feel like you could qualify. I feel like Jim Valente could qualify. I feel like half the women's team pursuit maybe could qualify for the kilo, which would be interesting. I think that would be fun. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe yeah, you never know, right? You never conversation know. for another day. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so this year was a hard year for you. Um, it's Olympic year. COVID hits. Yeah. Um, how are you managing that? How are you, how are you handling all that? Like um it's just like awesome. just in the sense with especially with sprinting like it's it's like you train you train you train you train you train then you race yeah and, and and when you race it's like you train for nine months out of the year and then you race for three and how like how are you handling that not having that kind of racing like are you going to go to any nation cups or what's that looking like for you yeah so i'll go back to kind of when COVID hit, right? So I just finished Worlds. Um, and that didn't go as well for me as I liked. Also, it was such a long season. I mean, with the World Cups, I was really happy with how the World Cups, you know, started. Um, but anyway, yeah, it was just, it, Worlds didn't go as exactly as I wanted. And that kind of hurt, you know. And, um, but you got to kind of look ahead and say, okay, I've, this is a two year qualification. I put in all the, you know, all the work too. And I got to be proud of that. And um, especially in Olympic year to, to get fourth. Um, yeah. And uh, I think also just overall, um, I think looking at it as, you know, as a sprinter, you're constantly, you're 
traveling to all these races and you're trying to train and get this, keep your strength up too, which is like a consistent battle in itself. So being home right now the past uh, six months, it's been nice to just be home and put in the work and see like, all right, I'm getting stronger here. Like these are things that I need to work on. And then another part is like, I wish I missed the racing part. Like it's been awesome to be home and here in the summer, they've had all the racing in T-Town um, usually every year, but now they don't. So it's just kind of been, it's in a different way. Like I'm home, but like, I'm not competing. So I just kind of have to look at it like, all right, so this is a little weird, but I've enjoyed being home and just putting in the work and training. And then my teammates too, we've been sparring in training, but it isn't the same, right? So you don't get that competitive stress, that atmosphere. And that's really, as a sprinter, you, you kind of need that. You need, yeah. you need racing, but the Veldrum did really, you know, they did a good job putting on some of the events here with the time trials. So it did get kind of some of the race jitters out of the way. Um, and just, yeah, it keeps some motivation. Um, it's definitely, I know it's been a hard year for everybody. And uh, I think just, you know, just appreciating those, those things here, being healthy, being a family. Um, you know, just, I've spent more time doing things that I normally wouldn't have. So I, I see it as a, like a blessing and a curse. And I've been able to manage my diabetes even better. Not saying that like I don't, but like I'm home and in a routine. So I'm able to really maximize this training time. And um, looking ahead now is just continue to put in the training. And, you know, they named the long team. So just to continue putting in the work. And um, we'll hear more about Nations Cup soon. So just kind of staying, you know, optimistic and knowing too, like, that I want to go for Paris and that like, you know, my career is all the work that I'm putting in now is going to also go toward the next path of, of races and, and everything. So. Is this your first long team? No, I, I, uh, made it. Uh, yes. Yeah. But, um, we didn't qualify as a nation. Hmm. So they named us say if one of the countries, uh, something happened. So we, we were like reserve three or something, but yeah, we, uh, first world cup was 2014. I graduated university in 2014. And then, so it was just all new to me anyway, too, the whole spring thing. Cause I just had started. Yeah. So, wow. That's crazy to think about. And like, like, cause there's been, there's been conversation of me transferring to sprinting. Like that mm -hmm. was, um, that was a talk I had with a coach in a bar actually after I did a kilo and it was like, yo, man, like, you should, you need to make a decision now. Like, we could, we could literally go full gas sprinting all the way to Paris. And I can't do it. I was just like, I just, I love riding long. Yeah. I love big miles and I love the team pursuit. I love pursuiting. Um, yeah, and I don't know if I mentally could wrap my head around going to, because, yeah, I would go to events, and the thing is, is, like, I might be good on a national level, but the mo I would have to spend two or three years on mm -hmm. a world level literally showing up, doing a 200, and that's my day. Yeah, and that was so hard for a long time. That's a sprinter thing that I think that makes you guys and girls, like, super fucking impressive because it's just unreal like because there was a time i heard and never saw it that eddie dawkins would show up to t-town and not qualify yeah i mean he was on a heavy training block too or he just didn't have his day you know it sucks yeah you do put a lot of training into it like yeah. 30 hours for 30 seconds like you know almost <laughs> It's unreal. And, 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 the, and the recovery is so important because the fast switch is, is so important. Um, so that to me is like, it's super impressive to kind of see like the, the long view of, of bike racing and like the sense of like, yeah, you might be going to Tokyo, but Paris is like still in the sights. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at first so long when I started, I remember like just crying and being like, I don't know if I'm good enough for this. Like, <laughs> Andrew would just remind me, like, it takes time. Just wait. It'll yeah. take time. And, like, really, it wasn't until the last year and a half that, like, I started really getting some results at that. I mean, I was getting results, like, with UCI events in T-Town the last two, three years. But at the international level, it was, like, Pan Ams, World Cups. Like, then it was starting to break through in the last year and a half. And I was like, okay, wow, I can, I can do this. Like, it was kind of this, too, like, 
all right, it just takes a lot of time and patience. Yeah. And sometimes it still does. Like I have had, I had a really great World Cup season and then I went to Worlds and thinking like I did, you know, everything I could to prepare, um, you know, everything like to go into, you know, Poland to, to train and just being really mindful of everything, sleep, eat, recovery. And yeah, going to Worlds and not doing well at all. Like it was just kind of like, okay, like what did I do wrong? Where did I, where did, where did everything go wrong? Um, but I kind of have to look at the big picture too. For sure. For sure. No, and that, and that's super inspiring to think about. And that kind of segues us into, I have two last final questions for you. Yeah. The first one's a fun one. <laughs> um, and then the last one is the nugget. So the, we'll start with the first one. The first one we talked about a little bit before. Um, if you could have coffee somewhere, um, you can pick anywhere with anyone dead or alive, how would you take your coffee or preferred beverage? And who would that be? And where would it be at? Yeah. So when you had briefly asked me that, I was thinking about it really fast. I was like, all right, I, I'd love to have coffee with the Williams sisters. Okay. Green and Venus. All right. Cause I grew up playing tennis and okay. I was, wanted to be a professional tennis player but I just love what they're all about and who they are and that they're still badass women and have children and it's just so cool they're really and, badass yeah yeah and um just want to talk about tennis and like their career and how they've stuck it out for so long that's amazing yeah but, um I'm not a huge coffee drinker but lately I've been doing um almond coffee like almond coffee. like pre-made I don't even know what it yeah pre-made with uh my clean athlete way for a team all right all right that's how you so you would so you'd be getting yoked with probably two of the most yoked badass women on <laughs> the planet that's on cool the, I, I think that's awesome on the beach in florida because we went to the same tennis academy uh, i went to well i went to the same time not at the same time but where they went to tennis academy in west palm beach florida yeah ac tennis academy that's where i went for a couple of years um, cause I was like, I wanted to follow their footsteps, but that's really cool. And see, I think I like this segment now because I like learned something. Cause I, I asked Justin Williams and he's like wearing a Lakers shirt and I was like, I bet he's going to say Kobe. And sure enough, he's like, dude, Kobe hundred <laughs> percent. So like, I would have never guessed the Williams sisters. That's pretty good. And so the last nugget, because I know you love juniors, um, and you love working with the youth and even just working with people that are new to the sport. Um, you're super helpful. You're helpful to me. And I'm super thankful for that. Um, but like a McKenna um, who's coming up through this sport, like what's a nugget that you would give that you would give an athlete that maybe has something in their way and it doesn't have to be diabetes or it's just like something in their way that they feel like is holding them back. What's kind of the nugget that you would give for them to just kick their leg over the bike? Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, with being involved with true sport, um, one of you saw a grassroots program, which really, True Sport gives a platform for youth and coaches, um, just kind of giving them those tools to go through life and sport and school. And just not only cycling, but I've noticed a lot of kids always feel like they're, if they're passionate about something, they're left out. Mm -hmm. um, it's like those friendships. They're left out of some friendships about, they're left out with some of the things that they're doing in school. So they're, they, they lose friends along the way. Um, and I say, you know, you're going to meet people in life that will make an impact, but also being passionate about something is not a bad thing. Like it's, you might not have friends in every, in every area of your life, but if you find something you're passionate about, it will expand so many different opportunities and makes you see the world in just a different point of view. And, um, I just had kind of different conversations like that with some of the youth about that. Um, yeah, you're not, you can't always be everybody's best friend. And, um, you know, there's going to be those people in your life that are going to be your biggest cheerleaders and, and the ones that are maybe not. And so you just have to really be mindful of the people that are in your life and that what you are passionate about. So it's kind of a vast answer, but it just primarily kind of focuses on something you're passionate about and not to be discouraged by that. No, that's super cool. Cause like, it's, it is a thing that people think about, especially like being younger and like having those friends in school and 
yeah. one's playing football, the other's playing baseball, and then you get into cycling, and then you feel like your guys aren't hanging out as much anymore. And it's like some of those friends that I don't hang out with from school still have a huge impact in my life. And if they yeah. ever reached out to me, it would still, you know, still pick up where we left off. So that's kind of cool to think about and, and you know, chat about. I think that's a good little nugget. And my best friend too, like she didn't grow up playing sports. I met her in middle school and she it's kind of funny story. We can go on and on about it, but she has a twin brother. I was actually born a twin. My brother passed away at six months. Um, uh, sorry, six weeks from sudden infant death syndrome. But anyway, it's kind of interesting how twins find each other. So my best yeah. friend's a twin and she was, had no athletic background, but she got into cross country and track and field because of me. And we we're just like, it was just cool that we had this friendship too. And like, we have just so much respect for each other. She's running um, for mayor and plantation where we oh. grew up in Florida. So it's just cool to see her drive and her ambitions. Like we're totally different people, but we're just, we understand and have so much respect for each other. Yeah. And I think it also comes down to like, you know, I, I love what you're doing, like that you found something that you're super passionate about and you're inspiring so many people. And it was so cool that, you know, you asked me to be part of your podcast and even Rudy here. Oh uh, yeah. The Papa Rudy. Yeah. That's going to get us all the views on that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. well, Mandy, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast. Thank you for your time. And guys, I will put a link in the description below to Mandy's social media, as well as her team, social media and true sport and all those other sponsors that she has down in the description below. If you have any questions, please reach out to her. Um, if you have any questions for me, um, yeah, I guess you can reach out to me as well. I'll answer, but I doubt you have any cool questions for me. So all for me. Cool. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> John <Powell. laughs> All right. Cool, guys. Well, thanks so much for listening. And uh, yeah, cheers.